so welcome everybody to our talk today about taking the data tsunami that open source projects produce and turning that into some actionable insights for your project. I'm Don Foster. I'm Director of Data Science for the Chaos Project. I'm also on the governing board of Chaos. And I've been doing this open source thing for 20 some years and I have a pretty big passion for open source metrics. I also wear a couple of additional hats. So I'm on the board of Open UK and I'm co-chair for the CNCF Contributor Strategy Technical Advisory Group. Hello, my name is Callie Dolphy. I'm a senior data scientist at Red Hat in the open source program office. And my day-to-day -day work is looking at analyzing open source communities from a data perspective. One of the biggest challenges people have with data is that it can be so overwhelming. This is especially true when you're looking at metrics for open source projects where all of the data is just available for you to gather and analyze. And too often, I see people measuring what's easy to count and understand, like stars and forks, which don't tell you much about the health of your project. Quite a few metrics tools, including the ones we have within Chaos, display what I affectionately call a wall of metrics. And these are pages and pages of visualizations that you can use to understand your open source project. And all of them can be useful, right? We have visualizations for so many metrics, but you should focus depending on what you want to achieve. And ideally, you should be looking at visualizations that help you find areas where you can improve or ways that you can measure whether you're achieving your goals as a project. Within the Chaos Project, we've historically focused on metrics definitions and collections of metrics called metrics models, along with software like Augur and Grimoire Lab, which allow you to collect and then visualize those metrics. We've also had a heavier focus in the past on contribution metrics, which tend to be used by community managers and others who want to improve open source projects from within but lately we've also expanded into consumption metrics, which help OSPOs and other people understand the viability of the open source projects that they're consuming. And these viability metrics models were developed by Gary White from Verizon. But a big part of using data is figuring out what questions you have and how you can take this tsunami of data and figure out which metrics can help you turn that data into something meaningful which is where our practitioner guides come in. We know that people get overwhelmed by the data. So we created a new practitioner guide series, which has a guide each focused on a single topic to help you get started. But the real value in the guides actually isn't with the data or the metrics, but in how you take that data you have and make meaningful improvements to your open source project. And in the next section, Callie's going to talk a little bit about eight knot, the 8-knot visualization interview for Chaos's Augur software, but more so also how to use approaches from data science to help make sense of this overwhelming amount of data. And then I'll come back and build on what Callie covers and talk about how to take that data and use our new practitioner guides to make actionable improvements to the open source projects that you care most about. With that, I'll turn it over to Callie. So before talking about community data analysis, let's think about how data analysis works in the general case. And when we talk about data science, you usually will see some type of this workflow. And why would we want to reinvent the wheel, literally in this case, each time we have a new data answerable question around community? How you set yourself up from a data engineering and process perspective will greatly impact your necessary time investment each time you ask, a, you ask a new question. Do you wanna repeat your work and start from scratch each time you need to ask a new question? Or do you want each question to improve your ability to answer the next one? And you'll be able to cut down your time by each metric. So now let's talk about this from a conceptual level, taking, putting data aside for a second. This is when you need to start thinking about what specific question or problem space you have around community. 
a lot of times people will come to me saying they want to do just the data thing and analyze this community with no real direction or perspective. And that is a really hard place to start from. And this is one of the reasons I really like the practitioner guides that Chaos is working on because getting, I know getting started is difficult. And that is really somewhere where I'm, I like that people have the ability to launch off from. Um, and I would say as a data scientist working on community data analysis going on four years, once the technical architecture is there, which we'll go a bit into, the difficulty lies much more in the concept. And even if somebody has a technical setup that is different than yours, you can still build and collaborate on that metric concept. So once you have identified an initial topic area or concept, you can focus on converting that into a question, that question into a metric. Um, the next step from here is to look at what information already exists. Has somebody else, chaos or otherwise, already developed a metric or set of metrics for your specific question or problem space? If not, is there something similar that you want to build that concept off of? These are where the ideas can start to flow. And many times there's not going to be a perfect conceptual fit, but something that takes you 70% of the way there is much better than 0%. And there's a lot of people who have spent time thinking about this and how different data analysis points applies to community. From there, you want to start digging into the specific data points that are needed and are available to you for this specific question or problem space. Then you want to go into whatever visualization that you want to use to be able to conceptualize it and what insights can come from it. Once you have that initial work in progress visualization, that's when you want to start going to get your community feedback. Pretty much whoever is the biggest skeptic in the room, that's who you want to go to first to be able to start developing this metric. So let's start to focus on things a bit data-wise. Very rarely are you ever going to need a single metric point or, met or visualization about a community. And once you get started on this process, even with that first one, you'll rarely end up where you started. By setting yourself up for the more general use case from a specific data source, every question that you do, two out of the three steps of those five steps in that data science workflow will not need to be repeated each time you try to analyze a community or different communities that are focused on a similar or from a similar data source. Um, gearing your tooling to one specific question can limit your OSPO and be time costly in the long run. Um, I can think of an example where I've worked with a community that built a huge tech stack, invested a lot of time to answer the single question about how many contributors are in the community at different points in time. And then when the time came to do even a slight iteration off of that analysis, the infrastructure they built was so limited and they had to backtrack and build completely from scratch. And some like conceptual examples of this is if you were just building to count how many pull requests, when there's still pull request data around when that is open, when is that closed, and all of the related information. If you just focus on that first step in the beginning and only set up from there, you just have to restart each time. And when you learn more about the problem space and whenever you do exploratory data analysis and start to become more just familiar with the data, the end, pro the end product that kind of evolves in that process is more useful than if you stayed in that box you defined at the beginning. So, and here are some of more of your common open source community data sources. Do any of y'all work with these in y'all's daily basis or have tried to work? How, how do you get the data? How does it come to you? Do you use an API? Do you get just like a data dump? I've, I've, you've been, you were nodding, but if you do not want to be called on. <laughs> Okay. <laughs> Sounds good. So it's directly, okay, so, oh, they have a really great platform. I like theirs. <laughs> but um, these are some of your more common open source community data sources. And most, if not all, of the data you'd want to pull around a community will be via an API, which outputs are in JSON or CSV formats. In the cases when it's not, a lot of times you'll be working with a direct JSON or CSV jump or dump. Um, beyond a one-time use case, those JSON CSV dumps get really complicated ex extremely quickly. I can envision that we all might have a growing folder in some repo that just says data dump on like one, two, three, and has plagued you at least once in your life. 
And we can just say that a workflow cannot be built on a fragment, a piece of information where you just have to continue, where it's just those iterative um, like files where you're having one, two, three, four, and it just goes and populates your file folder. It gets confusing. So this is in the data science world in general, we can start to think about like a relational data structure is the tried and true method to store your data for repeated use. Um, which related data structure you want to use is specific for your use case and preference, but having that relational structure is really the point. Um, some of the tooling also that you might use, which is similar to discourse, might be a couple levels of abstraction above this, but underneath a lot of times they are using or they are using those relational database or relational structures. And this allows for mapping between different types of contributions and the contribu contributors that perform them. Um, the data is cleaned and is in a reusable format, and it's easier to repeat on different repositories or communities or use cases. Um, when setting up your data collection for the general use case from a specific sport, um, source, the structure of the data is clean and consistent, and it also allows you to benefit from some of the more plug-and-play visualization tools to start from. You have your Grafana, your supersets that are used to using a relational database, and you can kind of start getting started from the more simple stuff very quickly, and you can allow your analysis to evolve. Another way to think about this is that when you set up your data collection from the general use case of the source. Um, another added benefit is that you're able to pretty much repeat analysis that is very similar with a slight variation, and the time investment is a mere fraction of what it is for the first time. So it's like when you think about it, it's each time you analyze some, something, something, the next time you do it in the same exact way, there is little to no time investment. And some of the like a use case, you can think about this for OSPO, is that many times they're trying to do the same analysis on different communities. When you set up more generally, that allows that to be done really quickly. A lot of the ways I like to think about this is in two different types. When you have something that is structurally similar, so if you try to think about time to first response versus issues and PRs, you have this relational structure, it's very small code changes or setup changes that allow for this analysis or looking at staleness of issues or PRs. And so these are two different types of data points, but the structure is similar. And then you have data similarity whenever you're looking at similar data points, but looking at it from a little bit of a different view. So an example of this can be when you look at PR review assignments, and if you look at it by contributor, or looking at it by all of the PRs, how many of them are assigned or un unassigned. So how does this look like in action? This is one, this is the use case that I use in the everyday that builds upon this general structure. So we use the Augur database, which is a chaos project that we take in different Git URLs and it fills an entire relational database full of GitHub information around the repositories that we care about. And so that gets that relational structure. And then the 8 knot dashboard takes the data from our Augur database, and we are able to do our visualizations and metrics off of this. And so we are able to use the Python stack and the 20 plus years of data science work that has been done in Python and be able to apply it to our open source community data. So we're going to do like a little bit of a quick demo of what this looks like. And if we have time at the end, we'll probably go into it a little bit more. Uh, let's see. So some of the examples that we were talking about, like for staleness, for example, we can look at, this is the 8 not dashboard, looking at the contributions page, we have pull request activity staleness, which is just the amount of time that a, the pull requests that are open have been open, and you can see them in a little bit of different groupings. And so we have the pull request run right there. And the issue one right here, you can see they're structurally very similar. If you look at the code on the backside, it is practically the exact same. It's just one is taking issue data and one of them is taking PR data. And then if you wanna look at another one of these examples was using the, the review assignments. And so this is looking at it from the individual user, which ones are getting assigned those reviews and how many of the reviews overall are actually being assigned. And the last example I want to go through real quick is looking at the pull request um, conversations or just times to first response. So these two graphs, and I'll scroll down in a second, are just taking that, what is the first comment not by the person who opened the PR, 
how long did it take? And this one's looking at it from a perspective of two days, and that's for the first response. And this is the one that looks at it from the conversation overall time. So I'm going to pass it back to Don for the rest of the presentation. Okay, thanks, Kelly. Um, which way is the? Sorry, I've lost the I've lost the mouse. I want it on this one so I can scroll. Oh, there we go. Thank you. All right, technical difficulties. So we've talked a lot about gathering data, and you've seen the demo of of eight knot using Augur, but it's also important to do something useful with all of this data. So we talked earlier about the tsunami of data and tools like Augur, 8Knot, and other visualization tools don't really solve this problem for you. You still need to think about what questions you have, like Callie just talked about, and what you want to learn about your project to help you focus on the data and visualizations that you really need to see. So as I mentioned earlier, the Chaos Project just launched a series of practitioner guides, which are designed to be used by people who may or may not be experts in data analysis, or frankly, even experts in open source, to help them understand how to interpret this incoming tsunami of data generated by open source projects with the goal of finding ways to improve the health of those projects. Now, these guides are useful for anyone who wants to better understand project health and take action on what they learn from their metrics to make their projects more sustainable. We have an introduction guide and guides on four different topics, which are listed here and I'll talk about in the next few slides. And we have other guides coming soon. Now, what's important to know is that these guides are all MIT licensed and each guide contains a link where you can find the guide in our data science working group repository. So you're welcome to fork the repo and customize it, customize any of these guides to meet the needs of your OSPO. And, and of course, we hope people will then make suggestions and contributions to help make these guides even better for us overall over time. The introduction guide talks about how there's no one size fits all approach to using metrics to measure project health. Every open source project is a little bit different and metrics should always be interpreted with the needs of that project taken into account. Or as Callie said, talk to your biggest skeptic. One of the places to start isn't actually with the metrics. Uh, whoops, sorry. Okay. Uh, one, of the, one of the best places to start isn't actually with the metrics, but by spending some time understanding the overall goals for the project. If your organization is driving the project, you should also consider the goals for your organization. By thinking strategically about the overall goals, you'll be in a better place to decide what you need to measure to determine whether the project is achieving its goals. And by focusing on the goals, you can develop a metric strategy that helps you focus on the metrics that matter most for you. However, your OSPO can't do this in a vacuum. The real experts are the people who are involved in the day-to-day -day work on the project. So you need to collaborate with them to interpret the metrics and any trends identified in ways that make the most sense for that particular project. Your contributors can help to decide whether an issue might be a temporary fluctuation instead of a real problem. What else is happening in your community, your project, or your ecosystem? Was there a big conference, a major release, or a bunch of the maintainers on vacation, or something else that impacted people's time to make contributions? And once you decide that you need to improve in some particular area, it's important for the step to have buy-in from the community and project leadership before you start trying to take action toward making improvements. Not having support from the project could lead the, to those changes being ineffective at best, or disruptive or even damaging to the project or the people who are contributing to it. The Introduction Practitioner Guide has so many more details and it's really designed to get you thinking about what you might want to measure and how to measure it along with some general tips and cautions. And it's meant to complement the topics in the other four practitioner guides, which I'll talk more about now. It's important to keep up with requests and resolve them in a timely manner, even if the response is maybe closing requests that aren't going to be merged. It's really easy to get behind on incoming contributions 
and, and we all get behind sometimes, right? Um, but not addressing these contributions promptly creates technical debt for your project. And it just reduces the chances that they'll ever be merged because older change requests are just gonna have so many merge conflicts that at some point they become impractical or too difficult to accept. Now, it can be tempting to attempt to solve issues with responsiveness by putting more pressure on the existing maintainers and asking them to respond more quickly and just resolve more contributions, as if that's magically going to make it better. Um, this rarely solves the long-term problem, right? It might result in short-term gains, but it could be damaging to the community and the project over time if all you're doing is burning out your maintainers by not resolving the underlying problems that are creating the responsiveness, uh, lack of responsiveness in the first place. So if you see responsiveness declining, it might be time to move more contributors into leadership roles and maybe promote some trusted contributors to become maintainers for your project, which I'll talk more about on the next slide. And the responsiveness practitioner guide has loads of details with other suggestions to improve responsiveness. Contributor sustainability is a really important part of assessing whether an open source project and community has enough contributors for the project to be sustained over the long term. So contributor sustainability has a pretty big impact on overall project sustainability. And there are a lot of projects with a single maintainer, but when selecting new maintainers, it's important to promote established contributors. And think about the trustworthiness of these potential new maintainers to avoid situations like the one recently with the XZ project. And many projects struggle to find enough people to actively participate in their projects and continue to maintain them over the long term. And the reality is that there are a lot of open source projects, right? And just not enough contributors. So maintainers are in desperate need for help across the various types of contributions needed to make a project successful. So it's important to think about how to better utilize your existing maintainers while looking at barriers to contribution that might be preventing participation from potential new contributors. And if there are not enough contributors to sustain a project, this increases the risks that the project will fail, which creates a variety of often significant challenges for the users and for the other projects that might depend on it. And the practitioner guide linked on the slide has even more suggestions. Now, we, we don't always spend enough time thinking about how organizational participation impacts the sustainability of open source projects. So you should also look at organizational diversity as part of the health and risk for open source projects. If all or most of the contributions are from people at a single company, what happens when that company has a shift in strategy? or gets acquired, or just runs out of money and goes out of business? Would the project be able to continue if that company pulled all of its employees out of the project tomorrow? So these single vendor open source projects might not seem risky, but they can quickly become unviable after a licensing change or when everyone just stops working on the project. And so if most of the work is being done by people at a single organization, the project might be riskier to use and harder to contribute to than a project with contributions that are spread out over many organizations with no single organization being dominant. Now, if you, as, as an OSPO, we're here in the OSPO track, if you work for that dominant organization, you might want to focus on getting contributors from some other organizations by reaching out to people you know who are using the project and might be interested in contributing. Now, the biggest challenge for identifying trends for organizations and open source projects is that the organizational affiliation data is almost never accurate enough to actually use without doing some manual cleanup. So this is described in more detail about the practitioner guide, along with some details on cleaning up organizational affiliation data and some tools to help with that. Now, the newest guide in the series, uh, which was just released last week, is all about security. It's important to think about security and its impact on project sustainability. One thing I look for when assessing sustainability is whether they make regular releases uh, and quickly patch security vulnerabilities. And in addition to just looking at the project itself, it's also important to look at the dependencies 
And we have a lib year metric, which you can use to see whether your project also keeps up with their dependencies, since outdated dependencies really can be a pretty significant security risk. And people tend not to trust projects with unpatched security vulnerabilities, and they're more likely to adopt projects that they trust to be more secure. So in short, projects that take a proactive approach by having a security policy, addressing security issues, and releasing fixes are more likely to be sustainable over the long term. And you can find a loads of more details in the Security Practitioner Guide. So we have a few links, and we will upload these slides to Sketch um, today or tomorrow. But here's a link to the Chaos Community, where you can find our metrics, our meetings, our software. We have podcasts, blog posts, more information about how you can participate. We're a nice, friendly community to participate in. Uh, the metrics with an X link is to a software as a service offering hosted by the Chaos Project, where you can use Augur and 8Knot yourself. You can add your own repositories or view ones that other people have already added. You can also have a look at the 8Knot repository if you're interested in learning more about how they've created the visualizations or to contribute new ones. And you should also, again, have a look at our practitioner guide series. Um, I've also added a link to an article called Beyond the Repository, which is a, a relatively short read, and it talks about some of the things you should be thinking about, like responsible use of data when gathering and analyzing data about open source projects. Now, throughout this presentation, we've talked about how the data about open source projects can feel like the tsunami of never-ending, overwhelming amounts of data. But having the data and the visualizations is really just the start of the journey. It's not the end. You still need to understand what it all means for your open source program office. And it can help to start with something small, to come up with a couple of actionable insights and ways that you can improve your open source efforts as part of a cycle of continuously improving and then building on what works and learning how to make additional improvements as your efforts evolve. And the practitioner guides a lot that um, I talked about used along with good data workflows and visualizations that Callie talked about can help your OSPO figure out what works best for you and your organization. With that, thank you, and we can open it up to questions. <laughs> okay, one of you pick pick each other. Who who gets to go first? Do we? Oh, sorry. Do we have a microphone for the questions? Okay, fair enough. We can do that. Yeah, so, so the, the question is, how do you, how do you handle things uh, from the security practitioner guide? Does it address things like, like false positives? How do you handle things when it's the best decision not to, uh, for example, update a dependency? Um, the answer to that is no. The security practitioner guide does not um, deal with that. What the security practitioner guide does cover is how to get started with security. So things like having a good security policy, having Dependabot as, as something that, that you use to keep your dependencies up to date. But again, it really is all about interpreting it in the light of your project. Like you said, certain projects like, like Kubernetes have loads of false positives and things that you, um, and lots of projects have dependencies that they don't want to update because there's been a breaking change and they're going to break something else and it's gonna require a little bit more, a little bit more work. So I think all of this really has to be interpreted in light of the, the project that you're working on. And 
one and maintainers just making good decisions uh, about the project. So the practitioner guides are really designed to help people who are new to security kind of get started. And what are what are some of the things they should be looking for? And there there are links off to like um, OSSF resources and things like that where they can where they can learn more. So for those scripts, are you manually running them each time or are you putting them on a schedule? And so that, I guess that would be, if it's something that you're continuously running, then trying to convert scripts from being something that you do like in a one-time use case to being like, okay, I'm going to run this at a monthly basis, then that data is already available for you if those it's analysis that you're consistently doing. And so at the very least, if it is going to be an output each time, you're going to have a folder with like consistent naming variations where it's like, these are each of one of those months. If you're not at a point of like going to a more relational like database structure, that's a little bit too heavy for the exploratory data analysis that you're doing, I would do like the one step in the middle and having it to be something that is scheduled and has that consistent naming. So then you have all of it and you have it in your backlog to be able to go back to later and it's all easily find. Yeah, and I would say the, the one other thing that, that I try to do, especially when it's exploratory and kind of one-off, is a lot of times I'll spin up a Jupyter notebook where I define like, this is the script that I ran, this is the pickle file with the output or, you know, whatever kind of file, you know, this is, and, and try to document that as best I can so that, because I know when I go back to this data in six months, I'm going to be like, I don't, I don't know what I was doing. Like, I don't know where any of this came from. I don't know what any of the parameters were. And so, so I try to do that. And I also have like, especially with, with things like, like output files, like, like pickle files or JSON files or something like that. Um, the names of those files are really, really long because I'm like, it was this repo and this start date and this end date. And like, I try to put as many of those parameters as I can into some of those file names because otherwise I, I won't know where, it, I don't know where it came from. Other questions? Um, so all the stuff that we've shown today is all like, this is all publicly available. You can either look at 8Knot if you want to see what goes into any of the visualizations. All of that code is out there. Any of the practitioner guides and any of the chaos metrics, they go into pretty specific detail of, okay, what are the data points that you should be taking in? How do you aggregate that data? How do you visualize it? If you want to see it from a conceptual side, that's when you want to go to the chaos models and the practitioner guides. And then if you want to see some of like the more technical implications for like what I was showing today would be in the 8Knot repository. And I will say that the difference between what that would look like at a large repo and a small repo is actually not any different. It's that's like the having that structured data similar if it's a git paste repository, it's still pull requests, it's still issues. It might be thousands of pull requests versus 50 or 60, but you're still looking at the same thing. Yeah, and one of the one of the cool things they've done with uh, with 8 knot and in particular the visualizations they get from from dash plotly is that that you can you can configure a lot of it. So with something that's massive like a Kubernetes, you might you might want to look at a smaller time frame because there's just going to be so much noise. Whereas if you're looking at a very small repository, maybe maybe you want to aggregate it, you know, in you know in smaller smaller or, or larger in increments depending on on what you're trying to look at. So the the Augur the technologies that it's the eight knot interface is built on top of it is is pretty flexible which allows you to look at different sized projects differently depending on what you're trying to see.
We have five minutes for more questions. Uh, yeah. Um, I just want to make sure I understand your question. So you're trying to ask if there is any way that we look at contributors that we're not familiar with in a community that we're analyzing often? I know we've talked, I've, I know on like the Red Hat side, we've definitely talked about that and trying to figure out, okay, how do you go about doing that? Because for example, with the Augur tool that we use, you have to point it to specific repositories to be able to start getting that data. And so you are, if there is a contributor that's in one of the repositories that you see, something that's really nice about Augur is that it lists off all of the other repositories that they're active in. And so maybe that'd be like a roundabout way of getting to that point. But it's something that we've talked about at a conceptual level. It's things that have been asked for before, but I have not done any significant work. I'll see. Yeah, we we actually we did a little bit of that when I when I worked at VMware. One of the one of the challenges is that when you start looking at your contributors and looking at what they contribute to other projects, some of that will be personal. Some of that may. Um, People get, it feels very big brother, right, to those individual contributors. So people get really uncomfortable really quickly when you start doing that. So the way we handled that at VMware was people had to opt in to giving us their GitHub handle, and we incentivized that by requiring them to opt in in order to do other stuff. But this gave them the choice, right? And there were some people who literally created new GitHub handles to use for the VMware stuff because they didn't want it tied to their other personal things, which is not ideal, but it's their choice, right? At least, at least they're making a choice and they're opting in to um, to that sort of analysis. And we we didn't use the chaos tools for that. Um, we just we used mostly just GitHub, the GitHub API to look at um, some you know other projects that they contributed to, and we found all sorts of stuff that people maybe shouldn't have been doing. Um, and it was it was a very it was a very interesting analysis. And we also found you know like. People were contributing to a lot to projects. We were like, wow, what is, what is this thing? Why are, why are we contributing so much to it? And so we found some really interesting things as well. Uh, yeah, you had a question. Yeah, um, yeah so I work for a hospital at group, and so we essentially the consumer of the data. Um, so I have two questions. The first question is about you know, some of those uh, data signals, because when I see data, we have to use it to drive action. Mm -hmm. right? But a lot of these uh, metrics are like bi-directional. So for instance, like the usual closing time, uh, too low or too high, I'll probably come back. Mm -hmm. But um, it's kind of like a little hard for us to find those optimal points to drive actions. We have got a lot of questions mm -hmm. from our project partners. They say, you know, like you're monitoring this, but what's your recommendation? So that's one of the difficulties of we're facing some kind of looking for guidance over there. Um, the second question is more kind of out of, out of the box. Um, because we did mention PRs, is actually, you know, we put a lot of emphasis on the metrics of project health. How we think about expanding the scope a little bit beyond the project health to see if can actually drive this more on the business side. Um, for example, you know, like nowadays people know girls hacking, right? So, uh, and the outcome of girls hacking is probably around the uh, customer acquisition cost at the cost side um, of things and then the life value of which is the revenue generation side. Um, as an OSPO owner, we're kind of thinking about, we want to justify our investment in open source communities mm -hmm. by bringing our contributor, but we have some hard work justifying how much value the contributor brings to the community. Um, so have we thought about it? You know, like, I know it's probably a stretch question, but um, Kiosk is a community which is probably closest mm -hmm. to that sort of truth. So I'm always begging for the solution. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah, I would say on the on the first side, um, I'm big about using these visualizations to make it more accessible to gather this information. Like what would take somebody 15 plus hours to gather manually itself versus let's get all that information there. You need the context of each community that you're looking at to really get the full scope of like say for staleness, like PRs, for example, for a certain community, like a larger one, there might be different thresholds that make sense. And so you would want to like use specific, like on eight knot, you would want to use the specific like ups and downs for how many days would make it into each criteria. And so then to adjust for a smaller community as well. And so I'd more say that you really can't make a all size fits all. I actually recommend against that for the, like because each community is so unique. You just want to figure out how can I use these tools to make data-driven decision driven decision making in general more accessible actually practical rather than just having to be based off of feel because that information is not sustainable to get and then from like the second point of view on like how do you try to argue to your business the value of open source uh, a lot of times there's many thoughts about this a lot of times where i try to communicate with people it is more from an engineering like production standpoint of being like when we invest into these open source software, there is an entire community and there's entire development that happens outside of our company that we get to benefit off of. There is no way for us to evolve as quickly as it is being devolved in this com X community. And so a lot of times that makes it a little bit more tangible when you start thinking about it from like an engineering production value. Yeah, and just to, to add on to that, um, what you, uh, the best way to justify the value of the open source work that you're doing within your OSPO is to tie it directly back to what your company cares about. So, so that's not something that we can kind of give you a playbook for, right? It depends on what the ant group really cares about and, and what you're trying to achieve as an organization. And then if you can fit the open source stuff into that and be able to craft a story around it. So when you know an executive comes to you and says, you know, why do we contribute to Kubernetes? You can say, we contribute to Kubernetes because you know this product is based on it, and um, you know, and this is what we're trying to do as a company. And you can tell this story that incorporates and pulls in your company, company mission, company objectives, and be able to be able to craft a story around that. And that's a very it's a very individual thing. Like I wish we had a playbook for that, but it's it's hard. And we are over time. Sorry, Shoya. <laughs>